the first question I wanted to ask you is, why is your organization pursuing a net zero goal? Why is, what sort of the benefits to EDF? What, why is it important to you as a company? Well, I think two things come together in this. Uh, one is the question of conviction. You know, certainly in EDF and amongst the business leaders I've met over the last couple of years, we know um, that we have to take action on climate. There is that conviction, not just amongst um, society at large and amongst employees in our organizations, but right across the whole organization at most senior levels, we need to take action. And then that comes together with the fact that for EDF, our business is in producing low carbon electricity. And that's through wind power and notably through nuclear power. And in order to get to net zero, we need um, a massive amount, probably twice as much electricity generating capacity than we have today, because we not only need to decarbonize today's activities, but also tomorrow's activities. So driving with electric vehicles and heating buildings, perhaps with uh, heat pumps. And in order to have twice as much electricity generating capacity, and to have it zero carbon, low carbon, we need to multiply the low carbon element by four times. So it is a huge, huge investment that needs to go in, and EDF's got a big business interest in doing that. So conviction and business interest come together to make it a real driver for EDF. From the point of view of a, an EDF consumer, how might they experience the journey's commitment to net zero? Well, I think, um, our challenge as suppliers is one thing is we need to make uh, electricity, low carbon electricity available. The other thing is we need to make um, it easy for consumers to adapt to uh, low carbon lifestyles. So we need to make it easy for consumers to have uh, electric vehicle charging at home in ways that is economic and simple and practical. Um, uh, we need to make sure that heat pumps are not bewildering and complicated, but straightforward and understandable and affordable. So I think part of our challenge is developing those products. Equally part of the challenge is making sure that they are products that consumers want to use and that therefore people's incentive to do um, what feels right is also right for society and right for climate as well. So I think that's at least as big a challenge for us as we uh, proceed down net zero because it's all very well having the greatest solutions um, they're no good unless some um, consumers want to use them. So that's what we need to do. So what do you see as the most significant hurdle when it comes to companies achieving net zero and how have you been able to grapple with that hurdle? Well, I think um, both uh, policymakers and delivery organizations really have major, major roles to play here, and we are going to be more successful quicker when uh, policymakers and delivery companies are collaborating. They understand each other. They're confident in each other. Let me give you an example. So we need more and more businesses to be signed up to getting to uh, net zero, to the race to net zero, if you like. Um, I think there's been a huge increase in the companies who have signed up to that particular campaign, race to net zero. We need more, perhaps particularly the smaller companies, the medium-sized companies, who haven't signed up yet. We need all of the businesses in the UK to be mobilized. And government's got its role. We need uh, the net zero policy, which is setting the path and which is getting in place the incentives so that when companies take investment decisions that are right for the climate and right for society, they can be right for their businesses in an economic sense too, because that's how we'll get the fastest and most effective progress. What do you know now, having kind of, you know, EDF Energy as a company has worked on net zero for, for a number of years, has worked on the low carbon agenda for a number of years, that you'd wish you'd known sort of five years ago, 10 years ago? Um, and actually, I suppose that there's two reflections, there's the EDF reflection, and then there's your individual reflection on that as somebody who's worked on this agenda um, for, for a, a number of years as well. I think the simple conclusion is we need to get on with it. There really is no doubt. Um, we need to be doing things in 2021, let alone 2022. This is not about things we might do in the next decade in order to get there by 2050. We Clearly, that's most true when you're talking about big projects with big lead times and big construction periods. 
Um, but it's not just that. We have to get on with it. And um, I think that uh, we found and businesses will find uh, two things. Some, some aspects of making the transition will turn out to be easier than we expected. Well, great. Um, and that'll be encouraging. The other thing I think is we're going to find that more than companies expect, doing the right thing for society, the right thing for climate, will be the right thing for the economic performance of their business. How could it be otherwise in the longer term? Um, the market the, has to reflect the realities of what's happening in our world. And therefore, in the long term, for sure, companies are going to be uh, successful who are doing the right things for the climate, the right things for society. And uh, I think businesses are going to find that's perhaps more true than they realize even today. So reducing carbon um, in many cases will reduce cost, uh, for instance. So is there any advice or learning that you would share for companies that are just, just making that commitment and just setting off on that journey? I think it's set off, get started. And um, it's not a question of making a plan for 10 years time, it's it's acting today. And uh, even if some of those plans need to be tweaked a bit in a year's time, it is so urgent and we learn from doing, I think, not from uh, uh, thinking in many cases, and therefore we need to get on and do it. And um, it's really not a future challenge, it's really today's challenge. So my simple message is get started. Energy is very much in the news at the moment. What are your reflections as an energy company in terms of how we should shape our energy mix to make sure that people are able to be protected from some of the kind of like some of the dramatic changes that have happened quite recently? Well, it's very important that the energy mix has a range of sources in it. Um, it'd be hugely expensive to power the grid off one single energy source, un unaffordably so. It has to be a mix, uh, very largely renewable, but we think. Um, having nuclear in the mix will make it lower cost overall. Uh, also, we need to, it's clear in the current energy crisis, we need um, self-sufficiency and we need sovereignty. It uh, has the whole country anxious that we are dependent, uh, more dependent than we wish to be on uh, sources that we can't control. So some of those arguments that we've been making for a while are suddenly written in the headlines in our newspapers day by day. So um, obviously one of the big uh, landmark moments that is coming up is COP26. Um, uh, you know, hu huge moment, huge global milestone. What, it, what outcomes are you hoping for to arise from that moment? Well, overwhelmingly, the big objective that I think we'd all have for COP26 is that we can get global alignment because important as what one country does, including the UK, is really important, but we can be overshadowed by what happens in the biggest economies in, in the world. And so we need to have global alignment in order for us to achieve these global ambitions. So I think that's certainly true for myself. Surely that's true for um, others observers that uh, this is about getting the best possible alignment across the globe, the big countries, the small countries, the developing economies, the developed economies, into a plan which um, can get us to net zero, because one country acting on its own, however efficiently, won't get there. How do you think it's important for business to work together to engage in broader systemic change and engaging with the kind of the policy audience and how what are good ways of doing that? I do think it's important um, for businesses to engage with uh, policymakers and with each other, especially in this area. You know, sometimes the debate gets fractious, whether it's a representative of the media that way or whether it really is that way as a contest between um, competing ideas. But when it comes to delivery, the delivery is quicker and more efficient when policymakers are confident in delivery is organization's ability to deliver, and when delivery organizations are confident that policy is gonna be stable and good and efficient. 
So I chair, uh, co-chair the uh, corporate leaders group, and that involves uh, quite a range of businesses from many, many different sectors. And our objective in that is to engage with um, each other and with government in a positive way, in the sense of what can we jointly do together to make this uh, more successful and quicker, and more efficient. And so rather than on uh, haranguing um, others to do more, it's more a question of uh, collaborating and inspiring one another.